Seven times I reached out my hand unto the seven rainbows and lifted myself on my feet so that I was able to walk to the top of the mountain. And immediately a cloud of the heavens lowered and lifted me from the top of the mountain, carrying me toward the rising of the sun, toward where the night was coming, and unto the night the clouds carried me, and unto the darkness I was carried, and in the midst of the darkness a voice spoke unto me, saying, Even in the darkness I will be with thee. And the clouds turned white, and the brightness of the fire was not there. And the wind from the setting of the sun came upon the clouds and shook the clouds, so it began to break in pieces until all was scattered, leaving only a small mist which held me, which soon left me standing on my feet on the top of a high mountain, My face was toward the rising of the sun, and at this moment a voice spoke unto me, saying, Turn again thy face to thy right hand, and thy face be toward the noon sun. This is south, and thy back is toward the cold hand. This is north. Thy right hand now point to the setting of the sun. This is west. And thy left hand point toward the rising of the sun. This is east. History is how we carry our stories forward. When I was a youth, I was a runner. Here I am at the age of 10. My friend Kirk, the chief of the Penobscot Nation, was also a runner. And Chris, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, was a runner. We ran with the letters A-S-T-C, a blazoned across our chest. Andrew Sock Alexis Track Club. In the year 1979, We represented Indian Island in the Andrew Sock Alexis Track Club in the state, the regional, and the AAU National Championship. Our coach and founder of the Andrew Sock Alexis Track Club was Michael Sock Alexis. His goal was to bring youth mentoring and health awareness all in the name of Andrew Sock Alexis. Andrew was a famous Olympic marathon runner who finished fourth in the 1912 Olympics. For me, the most inspiring story was when he won a foot race against his toughest rival while suffering from tuberculosis. He coughed blood at the finish line. Michael Sock Alexis also hosted many road races within the community named for Andrew. The Andrew Sock Alexis road races were a staple while I grew up in the community. Honoring Andrew Sock Alexis is something the Penobscot community has carried forward. Today we honor him through a training trail on Indian Island. The quarter mile signs highlight his Olympic appearance, Boston marathons, and his legacy that endures thanks to Michael Sock Alexis. This is the same trail I ran as a youth. Running in Andrew's footsteps, 
keep in time with the rhythmic pounding of my Penobscot community. It was one of those sounds that defined our community. When I was growing up, the rhythmic thumping was like an alarm clock. The sound of pounding ash early in the morning could be heard echoing across the pond, through the trees of the burial ground, up Breezy Hill, and out onto the Penobscot River. In the late 1970s on Indian Island, the ash pounding came from Eugene Loring. Down by the pond, just down the hill from Oak Hill, Eugene pounded in thuds and thumps that you could keep time with. The logs of ash, called sticks, would give in to the pounding in long strips. Basket makers called these strips splints. Forty years later, on the shore of the pond, at Eugene Loring's property, Wabanaki basket maker Gabe Frey spends the day pounding ash. Everybody has a, their own style. My Uncle Doug sounded like a jackhammer. Like he would just be like, like the entire log, same pace, straight out. I kind of like to pace it with the sound of the echo. According to Wabanaki traditions, Glooskap took an arrow, notched it in his bow, and he shot the ash tree. The basket tree shuddered under the thud of the arrow, splitting it with great force. From this split was created all the creatures of this land, the moose, deer, and bear, fish, frogs and fowl, birds, bugs, and beavers, 
and also it created Wabanaki people. Because the substance that brought us to life is the substance of this world, therefore we must always hold ourselves as a part of the world. Because we are substance of it. I arose from dust of the earth. I must see to it so that the earth may be clear of all obstacles and the land be our home and a home for the people who will come after us. Ashes downstairs. We'll start pounding. My Uncle Doug, Moose. But Jeremy and I pounded together for years. Jeremy was living on the island. 
every time we'd pound, people would stop and drive by. Keep it going. I associate the sound of pounding ash with the pounding of my feet on the pavement when I would run through the community as a youth. As I pushed up the back road, climbing Oak Hill, I could see my grandmother's house at the top, and I could hear the sound of pounding ash from the pond below. And as I entered my grandmother's house, I could smell the sweet grass. When are you going to come down? When are you going to land? I should have stayed on the farm. I should have listened to my old man. Have you ever had a song that transported you back in time? To that time, that place, that person? For me, it was Elton John's Yellow Brick Road. That song transports me back almost 50 years. My mother had packed myself, my older brother, and my younger sister into a small moving van in Fall River, Massachusetts. She was heading north. She was leaving my father. She was heartbroken over infidelity. When I hear that song, I see the night time skyline of Boston as we cross Tobin Bridge, and I see this beyond my mother's singing mouth. You know you can't hold me forever. I treasure this memory, and I am blessed that this song is a reminder of the first time that I ever went home. At dawn we were pulling into the driveway of my grandmother's house, Beatrice, she lived on Oak Hill, Indian Island, Maine. My grandmother was a basket maker, although she didn't weave. She braided sweet grass. I remember as a small child watching in amazement as the braids seemingly grew from her fingertips. Beatrice was so fast she could make grass sing as the blades whipped through the air and were brought together in fine braids. She sat in her chair, with another chair facing her. No one ever sat in that chair. The only thing I ever saw on the seat of that chair was unbraided, damp, sweet grass on newspaper. She would reach down and pull strand by strand, bringing each one into the braid. She braided until her death in 1990. Miles of braided sweet grass stored in her closet awaiting her weaver friends. The young maiden, because she is tender and with fair brow, she shall be the brightness of our house. She shall welcome all that come to abide with us. And because her strength is great and must be felt all over the land, she shall give it to those who come, because none can abide without it. Strength is hers, because she is the seed of the world. And her house always smelled like toast that she cooked on the on the stove and uh, sweet grass. <laughs> she had one of those camp toasters <laughs> yeah. that like she put that. On, the, yeah, right? on the propane burner. Should be your film company. <laughs> <laughs> Toast and sweet grass. <laughs> Toast and sweet grass production. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I like that. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it feels nice and homey. In our communities, there used to be sweetgrass braiding parties 
women usually are the ones that are braiding the grass uh, for their baskets and you braid a lot of grass and so it can be really time consuming and really tedious and boring if you're by yourself doing it so women would get together and have these parties and they were loud and they were funny and there's still stories being told about these parties in our community today. There was food and there was a lot of fun and a lot of laughter. Sweetgrass has always been really important in my life. One of my earliest memories is of the smell of sweetgrass. My grandmother always had a big bundle hanging in her living room and it always smelled so good and so even as a little tiny girl I love the smell of sweet grass mm. a long time ago there was an old woman who lived by herself outside of the main village she was friendly with the Mecham West or little people who are fairy-like beings who live in the rocks or under the ground and are known for their love of playing tricks. Even today, when we lose something, the Mecham West sometimes are blamed and gifts are put out in hopes that the lost item will be returned. One morning, the old woman came out of her wigwam dressed for a journey with three bags tied onto her belt. In all the many years they had known the old woman, the Mecham West had never seen her wear these mysterious bags before. They were very, very intrigued and decided to accompany her. They traveled until they reached the edge of a large salt marsh. It was afternoon and the sun was warm, the breeze was just right, and the salty air made everyone sleepy. The old woman decided to rest and put down her baskets and untie her belt and nap for a while. She sat the bags beside her and told the Mecham West not to open the bags. Of course, this made them even more curious and even more determined to find out what was in the bags. So they waited, and once she had fallen asleep and was snoring away, they carefully and quietly pulled one of the bags away. Bursting with anticipation and excitement, they worked to untie the knot that held it shut. Finally, the knot was untied and the bag was pulled open. Out of the bag flew hundreds and thousands of tiny seeds, jumping and dancing and leaping their way into the marsh. The Mecham West, too, jumped and leaped in surprise and began chase, trying to catch the seeds and return them to the bag. But the seeds were too fast and were diving into the mud. All of the squealing, running, dancing, and chasing woke the old woman up. Some say she was angry, some say she was amused and knew all along they would open the bag. She walked to the edge of the marsh and began to sing, and as she sang, bright green grass began to push up through the muck. With each verse of her song, the grass grew taller and stronger until thousands of shiny green blades of grass were swaying in the wind. When her song had ended, she blew her breath across the marsh, and the sweet scent that we know as woolly muskegul, sweet grass, the good grass, arose. Picking sweet grass and being in the marsh is always really special. A lot of good memories of picking sweet grass with my friend and her dog. Everyone has a special place that they go, and a lot of times it's somewhere that their family has gone for generations and generations, and you can really feel that connection. Really, in any marsh you go, you know that one of your ancestors has been there before you and has picked grass there. People who pick sweet grass talk about how they feel like the grass remembers them, like that sweet grass has a memory too and remembers us. My name is Chris Sokalexis. I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Penobscot Nation. With the fire crackling and the boys around it, the day became dark. Susip was tracing the outline of the arrowhead 
with his fingertip. Awasus looked at the arrowhead and reached for his sheath and took out a stone blade. The arrowhead and the blade had been from the cow moose. Grandfather had told them a story on the day he made the blade and arrowhead. The boys remembered how the shape appeared from the stones that Muckway had given Grandfather. Muckway needed a new paddle and Father had just made one and Muckway thanked him with those stones. They were black with small gray flecks. One night, Grandfather had struck those stones with another stone and sharp pieces came away from the stone. The first strike sheared off a piece that landed near Susa. The second one, Grandfather motioned to a wasus and then struck the stone. Grandfather laughed as he saw the large, narrow piece of stone land on the ground. Awasus picked it up and held it in his hand while Grandfather shaped the smaller stone for Susa. Grandfather pecked the stone with a piece of deer antler. Small flakes fell to the ground. The boys watched as an arrowhead was being formed. As grandfather worked, he began telling a story. It was a story of Glooskap and how he taught people how to hunt. It was on the shores of a large lake that Glooskap and his party of hunters saw a cow moose and her calf emerge from the woods on the shore of the lake. He bent down to the ground and picked up a small, sharp stone. He affixed this to a stick, notched it in his bow, and shot the cow moose dead. She was as large as a mountain and fell to the shore, part of her body in the water. The party approached her to receive the gifts. However, when they went to cut the belly of the cow moose, all they found was stone. The entire cow moose had turned to stone. She was now a mountain of sheer rock. Grandfather looked up from the finished arrowhead and looked at the boys. The boys' eyes were wide with amazement and awe. He held up the finished arrowhead between two fingers. Susep looked intently at the point. Grandfather told the boys that the cow moose didn't turn into just any stone, but that stone that Glooskap had picked up and affixed to a stick. Her gift wasn't meat. Her gift was stone, stone that was perfect for making arrowheads and other hunting tools. The boys knew that these were the stones that Mukwe had brought. For Owasu's, grandfather didn't make an arrowhead. He had said that the stone will tell you what it wants to be, and Owasu's stone wanted to be a blade. I shall now clean the earth of all obstacles and shall also continue to make for you and your children all the tools of stone until such time a power be given to you to make them yourselves. Now when you make the bow to shoot with, make an arrow also and make it so that the end next toward the animal be pointed. You shall burn the end so that it shall be hard, and when you send it forth, it shall penetrate into the body, and the animal shall fall dead so that you can prepare it for food.
In the spring of 2015, the Penobscot Nation joined others in an epic canoe journey that retraced Henry David Thoreau's journey with Joe Polis in 1857. Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Chris Sock Alexis was one of the representatives from the Penobscot Nation to join the trip. The first day of the paddle, the length of Moosehead Lake, brought them just past the precipice known as Mount Kineo, just past the cow moose. While the evening meal was being prepared, Chris removed some stones from his bag and began flint napping them into arrowheads. The other participants watched as Chris chipped away at stones that had been harvested from the belly of the cow from Mount Kineo. Henry David Thoreau and Joe Polis had camped near Kineo in 1857. As they approached the sheer cliff mountain, Thoreau wrote, while we were crossing this bay, where Mount Kineo rose dark before us, within two or three miles, the Indian repeated the tradition respecting this mountain's having anciently been a cow moose, how a mighty Indian hunter, whose name I forget, succeeded in killing this queen of the moose tribe with great difficulty. The story that Joe Polis repeated to Thoreau is a well-known story in Penobscot culture. Gluskop, a central figure in many cultural stories and the name that Thoreau forgot, is teaching people how to hunt. The hunting party was on the shore of a large lake when a cow moose and her calf appeared out of the forest. Gluskop bent down and picked up a sharp stone from the ground and affixed it to a stick. This stick he notched into a bow and shot the cow moose dead. According to the story, her demise was the birth of the mountain. The cow moose turned to stone. She became what we know of today as Mount Kineo. Often stories from the past can seem fantastic and supernatural. But these stories persist through time for very important reasons. Within many stories are clues on how to live, where to travel, or where to find resources. This story is about resources. The cow turning into stone seems fantastic and supernatural. However, the cow doesn't turn into just any stone. The cow becomes a mountain of the same stone that Gluskot picked up off the ground and shot from his bow, killing the moose. She became a mass of stone, perfect for making arrowheads. The story of Gluskop and the Moose is a tale embedded in the landscape and it is bound geographically. People who knew the story knew the location and the importance of the resources at that location. Kineo became a quarry for stone sought after by indigenous cultures paddling there from hundreds of miles in any direction. The point of the part of the story is not the hunt for the moose, but the resource materials needed to kill the moose and the location of that material. The participants watching Chris create an arrowhead became spectators to a tradition that stretches back thousands of years. The fact that it was taken place in a space where generations of Penobscot people had done the same activity connected Chris and the spectators back through time and to his Penobscot ancestors. Each strike of the stone echoed through the fabric of time. Since I was very young, I've always been interested in archaeology. I had a family member, elder family member, who became an archaeologist and 
taught me a lot about Maine archaeology and so I've been very interested since and growing up with that I learned how to flint nap along the way uh, making stone tools and for me personally I love to get different stones to make tools but my personal favorites is when I go up to Mount Kineo to collect the, the rhyolite to where I feel like I go up into the belly of the moose to, to get the stones that I want to work with and I could spend all day just looking for a handful of stones to work with um, but it's a very special place up there and um, and you can see a lot of history, thousands of years of history, just on that one mountain, uh, through random flakes and debris to actual arrows and spearheads. <laughs> 